Shall we rise up to pray? A great God in heaven, we thank you very much for our Bible study tonight. We bless your name because we're gathered for a good purpose. And we pray, Lord, you bless everyone in the study of your word tonight in Jesus' name. Expound your word, explain your word, interpret your word, influence us by your word tonight in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, you grant us the help of the Spirit of God. That the Spirit of the Lord will breathe upon the Word and will make the Word applicable to every one of our lives and hearts in Jesus' name. Prepare us, Lord, for glory, for the kingdom of God, that when Christ shall come, we'll be part of those people that will be qualified to go with the Lord in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. We're returning to Matthew chapter 5. Already we have studied from verse 1 all through to verse 7. And tonight we come to the study of verse 8. Please open your Bible with me. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Here are the very words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you know that Jesus Christ is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. If Jesus were to come here today... If Jesus was to teach us today, if Jesus Christ was to preach once again the Beatitudes, that is Matthew chapter 5, he'll be saying exactly the same thing that he said before. Because God does not change. He does not change in his nature. He does not change in his requirement. It does not change in the condition that leads to heaven. It does not change in the condition of relationship with him. And you come with that attitude to the word of God tonight, understanding that this word of God is irreversible. It's unchangeable. And this is still the demand of the Lord for everyone who will get to heaven at last. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. The end of all religion. The purpose of worshipping the Lord. The purpose of gathering together here. The purpose of him belonging to any church. Is that on the final day we'll see the Lord. If everything we do on earth, if all the worship we give on earth, if all the adoration we give on earth, if all the service we give on earth, if all the honor we give on earth does not end, culminate, and finalize in our seeing the Lord on the final day, then all that activity will be a waste of time. All the service will be a waste of time. All the worship will be a waste of time. All the interaction and fellowship and assembly here will be a waste of time. And because we're people of purpose, believers of purpose, we know why we're here and we know why we have come. And it is to see the Lord on the final day. That's the reason why we're here. If that is our goal, if that is our ambition, if that is our purpose, then you understand being pure in art is not an option. It's not that, well, I might have this, and then if it's convenient for me, I'll be pure in heart. If you want to get to heaven at last, if you want to see the Lord on the final day, there is no option. In fact, this should be the priority of our lives. Because we know the Lord will come, he can come at any time. And if we want to make it at that time when he comes, it is so important, so necessary, we must be pure in heart. Blessed is said, happy, that's the meaning of the word, fortunate. Blessed, happy, fortunate are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The heart is the center of life. Out of it are the issues of life. And therefore, if the source of our life, the very spring of our life, the very center of our life, and the place from which all actions proceed, if that place, that source, that fountain is pure, all the actions and everything coming out of that pure heart, then will be pure. We're told in Proverbs chapter 4, Proverbs chapter 4, reading from verse 
reading from verse 23 proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 keep thine heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life it tells us everything we do in life everything we say in life everything we practice in life all those things come from the very source of the heart and because of that he says keep that heart and do it with all diligence because out of it are the issues of life in fact he tells us in proverbs chapter 23 verse 7 proverbs chapter 23 verse 7 for as a man sinketh in his heart so is he that means the quality of your life will be the quality of your heart and the state of your life will be the state of your heart if you are pure within you'll be pure without if you are upright within, you'll be upright without. If you are sincere within, you'll be sincere without. If everything within the heart is according to the will and the word of God, then your actions will be according to the will and the word of God. In fact, Jesus Christ himself said in Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, reading from verse 34, Matthew chapter 12, reading from verse 34, here is what he said in the second part, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. All the actions, everything we do, every place we go, every plan we make, every decision we make, everything comes out of the heart. In fact, the condition of the heart determines what we say with our tongue. The condition of the heart determines what we do with our hands. And the condition of the heart determines where we go with our feet. It is the heart that moves and directs other parts of the body, including even the brain. It is the heart, not the other parts of the body, that have us guilt resulting from deeds done by other parts of the body, like the hand, like the feet, like the tongue, and so on. Also, what we treasure within the heart tells who we are what we treasure in the heart determines and reveals the kind of people we are and as we say that according to the word of the lord you begin to think about what you treasure in your heart what you hold in your heart what you think about in your heart what you plan in your heart what decisions you make with your heart because it is what you treasure what you appreciate what you store what to put in your heart that determines the kind of life that you live. In Luke chapter 6, verse 45, Luke 6, verse 45, a good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. If the treasure in the heart is good, what you bring out will be good. If the treasure in the heart, the store in the heart, the deeds in the heart, the ideas in the heart, the opinions in the heart, the thoughts in your heart. If they are evil, then their actions will be evil as well. In the second part of that verse 45, it says, Then and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out for the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. That's the reason why then we need to understand if we're going to worship the lord acceptably and if we're going to see the lord even here on earth because seeing the lord is not limited to heaven you know when you pray and then god answers your prayer that's god revealing himself unto you it means at the time of prayer you see the lord when you have temptation and you need the grace of god and god shows up and he says here am i and then he, he helps you and gives you grace to overcome in that temptation that's seeing the Lord. And then when you have a challenge, you say, like Moses said, Oh Lord, you say I should go to the land of Canaan with these people. And you have not shown me who you are going to send with me. You will not carry your hands except your presence will go with me. Moses said, Lord, show me your presence. I want to see your face. And then we're told that Moses spoke with God like a friend speaks with his friend. And then God said, you'll not see my facial appearance now, but you'll see my back pass. I'm reserving that other seeing the Lord until the other time when you come to the other side. But now I'll show you my back pass and you will see. And it takes, if you're going to see the Lord... 
in your present personal experience even today it takes purity of heart that's why jesus said blessed happy fortunate are the people that are pure in heart for they shall see the lord now being pure in heart is not limited to just doing the right thing you may say the right thing you may even dress the right way you know that those of us who are in deeper life here it looks like uh, you know dressing uh, you know moderately and soberly and all that looks like a specialty but you know you can have that outward appearance of doing it right saying it right dressing it right and yet not have a pure heart and look at second chronicles chapter 25 in second chronicles chapter 25 i'm reading from verse 2 Second Chronicles chapter 25 verse 2. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. A heart is an important thing. We're told about this man, Amaziah. He became a king. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, superficially, openly, externally, as far as the eyes of man can see. As far as we can compare his action with the reaching world, as far as we can compare his uh, royal activities with the reaching world, as far as any man can judge, and you can and you can say, if we judge this man by the reaching world, he has done everything right in the sight of the Lord. But God was looking at his heart, and God said, Oh yes, superficially, externally, as far as human eyes can see, as far as we can compare with the reaching world, you've done everything right, but not with a perfect heart. Is God saying that to you today? That if we were to judge you externally, openly, and there are people over there that might be saying, I praise the Lord. Since I came to this church, as strict as this church is, I have never been disciplined. They are telling us, in another words, I've done everything right. Everything has been just on the line. I've dotted every I. I've crossed every T. And nobody can me of doing anything wrong since I came to this church. Yes, my friend, but it says, Amaziah did everything right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. You see, the Lord is looking at the heart. He's looking at our thoughts, at our intention, at our desires, at our aspirations, at our proposition, at the things that are going on in the heart. And he says, if we're going to get to heaven, and if we're going to see the Lord, it takes more than doing everything right, even in the sight of the Lord, not to talk of the sight of man. It takes more than that. We must have purity of heart. In 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. I'm reading to you from verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature. I think we need to hear that once again today. Especially you overseers, and sometimes you know we need we need to use uh, you know some characteristics and yardsticks to choose workers and leaders in the church. And as we want to use uh, uh, we, we, the, the yardsticks we use today, as we are selecting coordinators and group coordinators and, and region overseers and state overseers and uh, national overseers and, and zonal leaders and women representatives and members of the choir and the people who are in the ushers and security. The yardstick we're looking at today most of the time. And we say, you know, we have all these points, and then number one, we take it right. Number two, we take that right. Number four, we take that right until number 12. We take everything right, and then we recommend them. You understand, it's very difficult for me as the general superintendent to be able to see to everything. If I have to choose all, all the zonal leaders in the church, even in Lagos here, all the women representatives in the church, even in Lagos here alone, if I have to get involved choosing the people by my myself i'll not do any other work therefore other people have to do that but most of the time academic qualification most of the time their stature 
most of the time ability to communicate most of the time some external qualities but god says i'm not looking at that and so that somebody has passed you approved of you and he has said you are qualified that doesn't mean you are ready for heaven because god is looking for something greater than the outward expression and the outward stature is looking at the heart of man that's why he told samuel and the lord said unto samuel look not on the on his countenance uh, why don't you just say yeah, anytime you want to interview people and then you read those words and you remember look not on the things which are seen but you look on the things which are not seen you look at qualities that we cannot write on paper you look at qualities that we cannot describe and say he is doing this he is doing that or he's like this or he's like that look not on his countenance neither look on his stature, because i have refused him you know sometimes if we're not careful politics might even come to the church because you see, you have recommended, A has recommended, B has recommended, and they have put their signature, and they have said qualified. And then and there are things they are looking at, and those things they are looking at, they are good, as far as external qualities and qualifications go. But when it comes into the heart, and we're looking at the heart, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the Lord. And then the people we have marked right and were qualified, and then we say, no, it cannot be used. It cannot fit into that situation. We're not looking at external things, but at internal things. Then sometimes if we're not careful, we might even begin to riot. You know, we were out in different ways. We're rioting, you know, methodically. We're out psychologically. We're riot in some educational enlightened ways. We don't carry guns. We don't fight in the physical. But you can tell. And it is because we're looking in different directions. Your pastor here is looking at this direction. He's looking at spiritual qualities and qualification the condition of the heart and then the other people are looking the other direction and if we're not looking the same direction we're going to get at a different conclusion and that's why god said in this verse 7 for the lord sees not as man sees for man looketh on the outward appearance but the lord looketh on the heart and it's the heart we're looking at tonight and i pray the lord will touch every heart the lord will purify our heart and the reason why i want the lord to purify our heart is to be able to get to heaven because as i told you and as you know yourself what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul or what shall man give in exchange for his soul if you are the greatest position here in our church I'm saying that because many times now, the ambition of many people is not to get to heaven. The ambition is, I want to be a state overseer. I want to be a region overseer. And I want to be a state overseer, a region overseer, in a very large state that has many members, my friend. That's not our ambition here. Our ambition is to get to heaven, wherever state you are sent to. If, you, if God chooses you to be a state overseer in a little state, praise the Lord, thank God, you are not even qualified for that. Nobody is qualified for even that little opportunity. But that's not our ambition. Our ambition is heaven, heaven at last, heaven at last, heaven at last. And when on that final day, when the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise and then we which are alive shall be quickened and changed and taken to heaven. When you get there at the pearly gates and say, praise the Lord, I am here not because I'm state overseer, not because I'm region overseer. I am here because of purity of heart. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see the Lord. I pray you will see the Lord. The blessedness of purity of heart. The blessedness of purity of heart. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, the possibility of being pure in heart. It must be possible. It must be possible. Because if it were not possible, nobody will be in heaven. 
If it were not possible, nobody will see the Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the Lord. It must be possible. And we know that many people have gone to heaven already. And without being pure in heart, they couldn't have gone to heaven. And so the very fact that those people are in heaven shows us it is possible. The possibility of being pure in heart. Point number two, the provision of purity of heart. What the Lord demands, he also provides. What the Lord commands, he also makes available for you and for me. Point number three, the promise for the pure in heart. Let's go back to point number one. The possibility of being pure in heart. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. It says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. They shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. Let's, let's start with this. What does it mean to be pure in heart? Because you see sometimes, if you don't know what purity of heart is, you might say you have what you don't have. At other times, if you don't know what purity of heart is, you might say you don't have what you actually have. And therefore, let us allow the scriptures to tell us what is purity of heart. Number one, you know, when something is pure, you know, when that thing is impure, you know, Therefore, when we say purity of heart, it means the heart has been cleansed. The heart has been purified. That's, that's a pure heart. We're told in Psalm 24. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. In Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4, it says, Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? O shall stand in a holy place, he that has clean hands and a pure heart. He that has clean hands and a pure heart. What's a pure heart? A pure heart is something that produces clean hands. If somebody's hands are not clean, his heart is not pure. You see, we can see the hands, we cannot see the heart. And it says, he that has clean hands and a pure heart. And what have we read in the Bible? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Out of the abundance of the heart, we have all the issues of life. Out of the abundance of the heart, the hand moves. Out of the abundance of the heart, the feet go the way they go and the places they go. Therefore, if your hands are not clean, that's enough. Your hearts are not pure. Because you must have pure heart and then you must have clean hands. Now we understand clean hands, salvation, pure heart, sanctification. But if the hands are not clean, if you don't have salvation, can you have sanctification? Can you say, you know, somebody is saying, praise the Lord. I want to tell you today, I thank the Lord. He has sanctified me, although I am not saved. Is that possible? Can somebody say, praise the Lord, my heart is pure, but my hands are not clean. Never. You must have clean hands and a pure heart to be able to make it. What's a pure heart? Circumcised heart. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Reading from verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. That's not infant baptism. And the Lord thy God, God himself, this is the work of God, will circumcise thine heart. That's not church confirmation. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. What circumcision? You know, when the little boy, the little baby boy has been born. Then on the eighth day, the child is circumcised. Something that the child carry to this world is cut away. Why do they do that? Because if they don't cut that extra flesh away, it will be the uh, depository of uh, bacteria. 
therefore it's caught away there is something the human nature the sinful nature the adamic nature you're brought with you into this world when you go to the lord after salvation then that sin is taken away by the operating hand of the lord the surgical knife of the lord that's circumcision and then it says it's the lord himself that performs such an operation the lord thy god will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, that thou mayest live. What circumcision of heart, when it takes place, you will love the Lord without reservation. You will love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul. And it is the evidence of the pure heart. Therefore, if you have some reservation, I love God, but not to this height. You are not pure in heart. I love God, but not to that extent. You are not pure in heart. When you are pure in heart, your heart will be circumcised. And when that heart is circumcised, you will love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul. What's a, what is pure heart? Number three is a new heart. A new heart. In Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. In Ezekiel chapter 36, I'm reading from verse 26. It says, And a new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. It says, I'll give you a new heart. I'll take away the stony heart. Well, what's a stony heart? That's a hard heart. What's a hard heart? That's a heart of Pharaoh. His heart was hardened. That's a stony heart. What's a hard, hardened heart? Heart of Pharaoh. Who is that God? That I should listen to him. What's a heart of Pharaoh? I know not that God. Get away from here. I will do what I want to do. What's a hard heart? A stubborn heart. An unyielding heart. An unbended will. The one that sets himself against the will of God. What's a pure heart then? A pure heart is a heart of flesh. It's a soft heart. It's a tender heart. That is yielding every time to the will of God. If your will is not yielded completely to the Lord and to the will of God, you don't have purity of heart. Because pure heart is a new heart. It's a heart of flesh. It's a soft heart. It's a tender heart. It's an obedient heart. It's a yielded heart. And if there is that self-will, that stubborn will, then you don't have the pure heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Number one, pure heart. Number two, circumcised heart. Number three, a new heart. Number four, a perfect heart. We're looking at 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8, reading from verse 61. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 61. Let your heart therefore be perfect. For the Lord our God to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as it is this day. What's a perfect heart? A perfect heart is simple. A perfect heart is, is the one that is walking in the ways of the Lord. A perfect heart is the one that is keeping the commandments of the Lord. You see, when people just use that word perfect and they don't understand, they say nobody can be perfect. All it says is, let your heart therefore be perfect for the Lord our God. And what's the implication of that? What's the result of that? What's the consequence of that? To walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as it is this day. In fact, if you had listened to the prayer of, um, of Hezekiah, you will not say that the heart cannot be perfect. Because we read in 2 Kings chapter 20. 2 Kings chapter 20. Reading from verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus says the Lord, Set thine house in order, 
for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and he prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember me how, remember now, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Ezekiel wept so. You know, he was about to die. And God sent us to, to go and tell that man, you will die, you will not live. Now at such a time, a person like that praying will have to really pray according to the will and the word of God. There will be no pretense. Because if he had pretense like the Pharisees praying, making himself to be what he was not, his prayer will not be answered. And his prayer was answered. And yet, and yet, what did he plead? What condition did he give God? And what evidence did he show to God? He said, God, I cannot die now because I've worked with you with a perfect heart. But he explains what he means about that perfect heart. I've walked with you before you in truth. That's a perfect heart. When every step you take, every word you speak, every way you go, Every opinion you air, that is whatever you say out, every idea you build anything on, any conclusion in anything you are saying, it is built according to the word of truth. That's the perfect heart. And Ezekiel said, I've walked before you in a perfect heart. And then it came to pass afore Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him saying, turn again. And tell Ezekiah, the captain of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thy days fifteen years. You see then that what is said was the truth. That shows the possibility. Yes, it's possible to have, number one, a pure heart. Number two, a circumcised heart. Number three, a new heart. Number four, a perfect heart. What's this pure heart? Number five, is a single heart. Singleness of heart. Singleness of heart. It means your mind is not here and there. You are single-minded. You are focused. Your heart is fixed on something which is the will of God. That singleness of heart is what is called the pure heart. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm reading to you from verse 5 and verse 6. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in singleness of heart as unto Christ. That's pure heart. In singleness of heart as unto Christ. When the Lord so walked in you, that you don't desire to do any other thing except as unto Christ. Anything you do, anything you say, anywhere you go, any action that you put forth, you are doing it. It's like you're seeing the Lord before you. And you say, I'm doing this to the Lord. And if I cannot do it to the, to the acceptance and to please the Lord, I will not do it. It might be little, it might be big, it might be in the day, it might be in the night, it might be when you are all alone, it might be when you are with other people. It is that attitude of saying, oh Lord, touch my heart, cleanse my heart, transform my heart to the point that anything I do, I'm doing it as unto the Lord. That singleness of heart is what is called a pure heart. And then it says in verse 6, not with eye service as men pleasers. If we're doing eye service, we don't have pure heart. If we're only here to please men, then we're not having pure hearts. And you know the people that shall men pleasers, when people are there, they do their very best. Especially people, they know that I will be able to give them some honor, some respect, some reward. They do their very best. But when, when you turn your back, and then people are not there anymore, they do whatever they want to do. It may be pleasure. It may be that they have some material gain. And when people are not there that will check them up, then they do whatever they want to do, then you don't have a pure heart. Because a pure heart makes you to be a God pleaser rather than a man pleaser. Not with high service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Number six is a true heart. 
pure heart is a true heart. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 22. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Here the word of God declares, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Let us draw near with a true heart. What's a pure heart? A pure heart is a true heart. It's not as complicated as some people feel. Just a true heart. Then it says, with a full assurance, with assurance, with full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. When all the evil conscience is taken away and you don't have any guilt for anything. You don't have any blame for anything. No condemnation for anything. Your heart is clear as daylight. And your heart is so light. There is no heavy burden. There is no condemnation. There is no guilt. Everything is just clean with a pure conscience. Pure heart. Number seven, an honest heart. Honest heart. In Luke chapter 8, verse 15. Luke chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 15. In Luke chapter 8, verse 15, here is what the word declares unto us. But that... On the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart. Honest and good heart. Honest with God. Honest with yourself. Honest with the watch of God. In a good and an honest heart, it says, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Now, the possibility of this we find in scripture. Already I've read to you about Ezekiah. And Ezekiah pleaded before the Lord. Oh Lord, I've walked before you in all truth and with a perfect heart. And God said, that's right, that's true. You walked with a perfect heart. If Ezekiah could have it, then we can have it. It is a possibility. Not only that, look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, verses 8 and 9. And God, which knoweth the, heart, knows the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as it did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Here Peter was recounting, was retelling the story concerning Cornelius and his household. He went to the household of Cornelius. While he was just speaking, the Holy Ghost came upon them. And now he compared them with the apostles. That's why he said, them and us. And he says, and God, who knows, which knows the hearts. That is, he knew the hearts of these people. If their hearts were impure, God would have known. If their hearts were uncircumcised, God would have known. If their hearts were the old heart, the stony heart, the hardened heart, the stubborn heart, God would have known. If their hearts were imperfect hearts, God would have known. If their hearts were double-minded, not single, not focused on the will of God, the Lord would have known. If their hearts were untrue, if their hearts were dishonest, the Lord would have known. But then Peter said, God who knows the hearts, gave them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. He made no difference. He put no difference, purifying between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. That's a testimony that these people had pure hearts. That means then it's a possibility. And if it was possible for Cornelius, and if it was possible for those people, they, are, they were Gentiles like you and I are Gentiles. If it was possible for them, it's possible for us. I said it's possible for us. Purifying their hearts by faith. If our hearts are not purified, if the problem is not with God, the problem is lack of faith. We're looking at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2. As you look at this, you will find that other people have got the experience with you, we will have the experience. In First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, 
But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust for the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which tries our hearts. Not pleasing men, not pleasing men, but pleasing God who knows our hearts and who tries our hearts. That tells you already. Not pleasing God, I read it to you already in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. That when you make up your mind, that come what may, in whatever situation or condition in life, your purpose, your single purpose is to please the Lord. You're not going to please any man to the detriment of your soul. That's a pure heart. And Paul, the apostle, said that's exactly what we heard. And then in verse 5, for neither at any time used we flattering words as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others. We, that when we were, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children. You learn something there? Pure heart makes us gentle. Soft heart makes us gentle. And a yielding heart, a bending heart, a, a, a submissive heart to the Lord, a pure heart, makes us gentle. If we're harsh and hard, oppressive, very tough, and we jump and bump on others, and we don't have any compassion, and we don't care how people feel, and we don't care the result of our action, we don't have pure hearts. Pure hearts, fleshly hearts, soft hearts, sincere hearts, honest hearts, new hearts, circumcised hearts, makes us gentle, compassionate, considerate, loving, merciful. It says in, verse, in the next verse, that is in verse 8, so being affectionately desirous of you or willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preach unto you the gospel of Christ. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. That's Paul the Apostle with his companions in labor, telling us that here is the experience that he had, and I believe it, if it was possible for him, it is possible for us. And it's going to be done in our lives in Jesus' name. Point number two, the provision of purity of heart. The provision of purity of heart. And let's come to Matthew chapter 5 again. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Matthew chapter 5, looking at verse 8. Jesus Christ emphasizes to the people then, and he emphasizes to us at this time. He says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We want to inform ourselves that God has made sufficient provision for the purification, purifying, sanctifying of our hearts. But we have to make use of this provision so that the blessing of purity of heart can be our experience. Beside the provision, God has given, God has the power to change man and to change any creature. He can change our nature. It can change our mind. It can change our soul. It can change our spirit. And because it can change us, that's why we know we can be pure in heart. Because God says there is nothing too hard for him in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32. Because here is what God said. Then we know there is nothing impossible it can purify our hearts. We're told in uh, verse 27, Jeremiah 20, 32, 27, Behold, 
I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? What's the answer? No. Is there anything too hard for God? You say, I have been this way. Can there be a change? Can there be a transformation? Can there be purity of heart? The Lord is asking you. You are asking, can I be pure? Can I be holy? Can I be sanctified? Can I be pure through and through, within and without, in every action, in every thought? While you are asking God that question, he's asking you to, is anything too hard for me? Verse 17. In verse 17, that is that same Jeremiah chapter 32. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretch out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Tonight, there's nothing too hard. The Lord will do it. We're told in Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. Here are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In verse 26. And Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. He can make us pure in heart. He has promised it. And what he has promised, he has power to fulfill. Jesus said with men, this is impossible. If you look at the history of men, it will be very difficult for you to find somebody who is not depending upon God, who becomes pure in heart every day, every month, every year of his life. But if you're looking at God and you see the ability of God, the divine ability of God to perform that divine oppression in us, God, Jesus said, although this is impossible with man, with God, all things are possible in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. God can do it. And he has made the provision for it. Luke chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 37. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. What has God promised then? What provision has God made concerning the purifying, the sanctifying of our hearts? Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. And the Lord thy God, first of all, he has to be your God. He doesn't circumcise the heart of strangers. Those who are strangers to God. Strangers to the grace of God. Strangers to the kingdom of God. You are born again. Be therefore, he becomes your God. You've given your life to the Lord. You have believed on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And because of that faith in Christ, you are brought into the kingdom. You are born again. And then he becomes the Lord your God. But he's not finished. He still wants to do another thing. That's why it says the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. And the heart of thy seed. And the heart of thy seed. And the heart of thy seed. And that's the evidence we have that shows us that sanctification is not limited to the first generation of believers. It will circumcise your heart in the first generation. As those generation of people pass, as they pass away, the seed coming after them, the children coming after them, the converts coming after them, it will circumcise the heart of your seed. And isn't that the same thing with the baptism in the Holy Ghost? As it is with salvation, he saved the people then, he's saving the people today. He sanctified the, he sanctified the people then, he sanctified people today. He baptized them in the Holy Ghost in days gone by. The promise is unto you and to your children, to your seed, and to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, are far off. Don't you understand? 2,000 years since the time of the Acts of the Apostles, we are their far-off people. 
Because you see, they were baptized in the Holy Ghost many, many years ago. And now we, 2,000 years after, are far off. The promise is still unto us. Salvation for them, for us. Sanctification for them, also for us. Holy Ghost baptism for them, also for us. And here we're talking about the circumcision of the heart. It says, the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed. And when he does that, we will love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. I pray it will happen. We're looking at Psalm 51. Psalm 51. We're looking at it from verse 6. Psalm 51, verse 6. It says, uh, if I read from verse 1, have mercy upon me, O God. That's prayer. That's prayer. That's prayer. That's prayer. This circumcision of heart is not going to take place just like that. It's not the preaching. It's a praying. No matter how many times we hear about purity of heart, if we don't take what we hear to the Lord in prayer, we'll never have it. It's just like a sinner. If a sinner hears message of salvation, 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 he may hear that message a thousand times. If he does not commit himself in a very definite way to the Lord in prayer, to confess and to forsake and to believe on the Lord, he'll never be saved. A thousand messages on salvation does not save a soul, except that soul will take that message to the Lord in prayer. And it has some messages on pure heart. It has some messages on sanctification. Will never sanctify anybody without going to the Lord in prayer. Don't you see what Jesus did in John chapter 17? Sanctify them. He was praying unto the Lord. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And Paul the apostle said, I pray the God of peace sanctify you holy. It needs prayer. And sometimes when we finish a you know, message, maybe a Bible study, maybe a Sunday worship, and then we begin to pray. There are some people that don't pray. They just hear in the head. Just write the note. And those messages don't save anybody. And those messages don't sanctify anyone. It's when you take it to the Lord in prayer. And here is David praying before the Lord and saying, Oh Lord, I need something. If he's him, he knew because he is the one that wrote Psalm 15. Lord, who shall abide in your tabernacle? Who shall dwell in that holy place? And the Lord gave him the answer. Again in Psalm 24, he asked that question. His desire, his mind, his aspiration, his ambition was to be able to see the Lord on the final day. Because of that now, he knew that something was wrong in his life. That's why he came in prayer before the Lord. And part of the prayer, look at verse 6. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden parts, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me, that's prayer. Purge me with Esau, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. You understand? When God was talking to the sinners and he wanted them to be saved, he said, you confess your sin. That's in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. And then he says, he'll make you as white as snow. That's salvation. Here he's going deeper, he's going higher, he's going greater. And he says, purge me now, wash me. I shall be whiter than snow. He's asking for another experience that makes you higher, greater, deeper than you ever had before. Then he tells us in verse 8, make me hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out my transgression creating me. A clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit within me. You see the prayer that the man prayed. And if we're going to have purity of heart, sanctification in our experience, it takes prayer. We will pray. I said we will pray. And I, I, I'm praying that, you know, those who have become careless in our church, and I see it almost everywhere I go, those who have become careless in our church, and they do not know that prayer has power. And prayer changes people. And prayer transforms people. And then during the time of prayer, it's like, uh, that's enough, that's enough. 
I said it over and over, but I'm so surprised, you know, you spend one hour, one hour, 30 minutes, one and a half hours in studying the Bible, going from verse to verse, and then to now, take what you have learned to the Lord in prayer, and we, you know, we find that, some, not everybody, I know there are people who pray, but, you know, we find that so difficult, but things will change. And then we were able to take it to the Lord in prayer. We say, Lord, this is what I need. Because without prayer, how can sinners get saved? Without prayer, how can believers get sanctified? Without prayer, how can sanctified believers have the power of the Holy Ghost in their lives? Oh, we're looking at, um, at Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. I'm reading from verse 25. Ezekiel chapter 36, reading from verse 25. It says that this is the promise of God. Then when I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from your filthiness and from all your idols, will I cleanse you. And when, when God cleanses us, we shall be clean. I said we shall be clean. Then it says in verse 26, a new heart, a new heart, a new heart. Why is God promising us a new heart? Because he knows the old heart will not take us to heaven. The old heart belonging to the old nature, to the old dispensation, and to the old characteristic that will not take us to heaven. That's why it says a new heart also. Will I give you? And then it says in that verse 26, A new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away. And I will take away. What's he taking away? What's he taking away? Stony heart. And now look up here. You know sometimes uh, when I teach, almost every time, uh, not every time, but almost every time, I mention this kind of stubborn will. Hardened heart. Why do I concentrate on such a thing? Because I don't want to labor in vain. I want you to get to heaven. And I know that if the stubbornness is there, if the stubborn will is there, if the unyielding, unbended will is there, we will not be able to get to heaven. That's why I'm so concerned. And I'm saying, because we came here, so we can get to heaven. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the Lord. That's the reason we emphasize it, and, it, and it's very good for you. It's like when you get to your doctor, and your doctor is always saying, looks like you are not listening. You're still taking too much salt. It's killing you. And then you go back there, and you say, let the doctor say what he wants to say. I just like so much salt. Already you have diabetes, and the doctor measures you again, and, measure, and looks at your blood, and he says, looks like you're not listening. You're taking too much sugar. You say, doctor, say what you want to say. Every time you get to the doctor, the doctor is saying, too much sugar, too much sugar. You're killing yourself. And then you think you're hurting the doctor. That you want to show the doctor, I'm a man of myself, a woman of myself. And you say, give me the sugar and give me add everything. I want to take it. It's you that will die of diabetes. We need to listen. If we're going to get to heaven, the Lord is saying, I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. Now, your stony heart doesn't hurt another person. It's you it hurts. The stony heart doesn't hurt me. I'm saying it because it's my duty, because I'm the preacher, because I'm your pastor, and because I have the desire to get you to heaven. That's the reason I'm saying it, not because it hurts me. By now, I should be able to, you know, get over all those things, that those things don't bother me anymore. But I know that even if it doesn't bother me, a stony heart, a stubborn will, a rebellious heart will hinder you from getting to heaven. That's why, look at the promise again. In that Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, in your heart also will I give you, we will receive it. And a new spirit will I put within you, or I'll have it. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you an heart of flesh. Give me a good amen. amen. In Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading there from verse 25. This is the provision of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 25. Ephesians 5, verse 25. 
Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for it, that ye might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. I pray it will happen. And when it happens, what joy we will have. Let's see how Jesus prayed for his own disciples in John chapter 17. John chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 6. It says that Jesus was praying for his own disciples. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. And they have kept thy word. Obviously, they were born again. They were saved already. And yet, even though they were saved, he was still praying for some other, one other thing. One other Christian experience that he needed to have. That's why it says, now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them. And they have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou have sent me. They were born again. Look at verse 14. I have given them thy word. And the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. That's the evidence they were born again. In verse 15 I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. But that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Dying, uh, they, they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Obviously, they were born again. But look at verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He was praying to the Father. And he said, yes, they are saved. Yes, they are not of the world. Yet, there is something that remains in them that needs to be removed. And the Lord Jesus was praying for the sanctification of his own disciples. Why was he praying for their sanctification? Because he was going to heaven. And he wanted to take them to heaven. He wanted it to be so that where he is, there they will be also. And he knew that without that sanctification experience, they will not be there. Wasn't he the one that preached? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's the reason he was concerned. And that's the reason he wanted them to be sanctified. He tells us now in verse 20, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. You see, sanctification is for us as well. For them also, who will believe on Christ through the words of those apostles, verse 21, that they all may be what? That they all may be one. You know, sanctification makes us one. Sanctification brings unity. Unity of heart. Unity of purpose. Unity of intention. Unity of ambition. Unity in wanting to glorify God. And you know, anywhere there is uh, disunity, there's no sanctification there. It's either this one is sanctified, that one is not sanctified. Argument, conflict, explosion. As we strike one another, as we oppose one another, that's not sanctification. And if we want the prayer of Jesus to be fulfilled in us, I know how the other people take this passage. That they all may be one. The way they understand that passage is that the Catholics and the celestial people and the white garment churches and deeper life and assemblies of God and first Quran, all the people that they all may be one. No sanctification, no salvation even, just that we all may be one. And what kind of unity is that? That we all may have combined service, you know, Sele and Catholic and Anglican and Methodist and Presbyterian and Deeper Life and Pentecostal, everybody come to the same hall and listen to the same message and, you know, do the same dancing and have the same music. That's what they think Jesus prayed for. That's not it. What Jesus prayed for is that, number one, let them get saved. Then sanctify them 
purify them purge them turn their hearts around give them this heart of flesh purge them circumcise them that they all may be one now if you love god with all your heart and all your soul and the only thing you want is to please the almighty god and i love god with all my heart and all my soul and the only thing i want is to please the lord we're going to be united if i'm not seeking my own will and you are not seeking your own will and we're seeking the only central will of the almighty god on high we're going to be united if all i want is obedience to the word of god and all you want is obedience to the word of god we're going to be united if i want to be controlled by the spirit of god only and you want to be controlled by the spirit of god only we're going to be united if all i want is the glory of god if all you want is the glory of god and we're not looking for the glory and the honor that comes from man if that's you if that's me we're going to be united what jesus christ paid for that they all may be one when we're sanctified and the only thing you are seeking the only thing you're looking for is the glory of god and the honor of god and satisfying god and living to please the lord not to please yourself not to please man that's what jesus prayed for that they all may be one as thou father at in me and i in you that they may be made perfect in one that's in verse 21 that they all may be, may be one as thou father art in me and i in thee and that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and the glory which thou gavest me i have given them that they all may be one even as we are one I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. I pray it will happen. Give me a good amen. amen. Point number three, the promise for the pure in heart. What's the promise? When we allow God to pardon us, number one. Number two, to purify us. And we keep that purity of heart as an experience. What is going to be the consequence, the result, the reward of that? In Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 8. Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 8. It says in Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. For they shall see God. The purity of heart we are talking about eventually leads us to this great privilege. To this great reward. And to this great realization of when we die here on earth. To be able to see the Lord up on high. It tells us in the word of God in Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah chapter 33, I'm reading from verse 15, Isaiah 33, reading from verse 15, it says, He that walketh righteously, and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shorteth his eyes from seeing evil he shall dwell on high his place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks bread shall be given him his water shall not fail thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty they shall behold the land that is very far off do you see that and as, as, as you look at those items those characteristics those qualifications in the lives of the true believer it says he walketh righteously that means it's not just that he walked in the past righteously and today is all unrighteous things have changed standards have changed and the consecration has changed no he walketh continuously continually is walking righteously number two in that uh, same uh, verse uh, verse 15 he speaketh uprightly not that he spoke only but he's still speaking uprightly he doesn't tell lies he doesn't pretend he does not deceive and he does not is not hypocritical he says the truth in his heart. And these are the pure in heart. 
These are the people that have experienced from the Lord. And then it says, he despises the gain of oppression. He despises the gain of oppression. Whatever the gain is, material gain, or personal, private, psychological gain, if it is coming through oppression, it says no. It's that it's too pure to have any gain that comes in an impure way, in, an, in a fraudulent way. He despises the gain of oppressions. He shaketh his hands from holding bribes. He will not give bribe. He will not hold bribe. For whatever reason, looking for job, you've been looking for this job for a long time. When you are a real child of God, you don't have anything to do with giving bribes or taking bribes. You want to pass exam. If uh, getting to heaven is more important to you than passing exam, you're not going to give bribes to the invigilators or to the, or to the uh, examiners so that you can pass the exam and then miss heaven. But it says he's shaking his hand from holding bribe. He stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood. All those uh, criminal kind of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the photograph and the pictures and the video and you know, all these home videos that uh, they, they are, they're giving all around. And it's all violence. And even when, you know, some of these people say they are Christian people. This is Christian ministry. And they're giving videos. And I'm so surprised that even some Christians, so-called Christians in this church, they'll be, you know, looking at those videos. No time to read the Bible. The cassettes are there. No time to listen to the cassettes. And the videos and then the, and the CD, DVD, they are there from the church. No time to actually sit down and get over the Bible study again in CD or DVD or whatever. But all these things that are circulating. And you can almost go into the houses of some of the people and you find the things there. But you see, you're not looking at those things. The crime may just be about five minutes because you see all those who are producing those things, they have to put in this one and this one and this one. That's the way they are trained. Because you see, if there is no crime and if there's nothing sensational in what they are giving out, if it's only just the message, just like I'm preaching now, if that's what they give out, nobody is going to buy those things. Therefore, you have a lot of those things. And we who are Christians who are getting ready for heaven, you shake your hands away from those things. If you have them at home, pack them somewhere. And then read the word of God. Concentrate on the word of God. He is not going, he stops his ears from hearing of blood, shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. He, sh he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of the rocks. And then it says, bread shall be given him, and his water shall be sure. His eyes shall see the king in his beauty. And they shall behold the land that is afar, very far off. It's talking about the fact that when you are pure in heart and you have this Christian experience with the Lord, you will see the Lord. I pray you will see the Lord. In Job chapter 19, Job chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 25. Job 19 verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. And that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. That's a pure in heart. That's a pure in heart. But you know, before a man can say this, that I know whatever happens after death, I shall see. I shall see God. Whom I shall see for myself. And mine eyes shall behold and not another. Though my reins be consumed within me. Now, this man that is saying something like this, let me show you what he had said earlier. That's in chapter 17, chapter 17 of Job. Chapter 17 of Job, verse 9. Chapter 17 of Job, verse 9. The righteous also shall hold on his way. He that has clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. It's after that he knew about the righteousness. He knew about the holiness. He knew about the purity. It's after that experience of righteousness, holiness, and purity. He now said, I know I will see the Lord. I know I will see the Lord. Because blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We're looking at First John chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. 
Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew, not, it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him. For we shall see him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. If we're going to see him on that final day, every man, every one that has this hope in him, purifies himself, even as he is pure. And let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men. With how many men? Let's look up here. Your landlord. The people who have hurt you. You know, Christians, we want to get to heaven. But those people out there, they don't think about heaven. They just do what they want to do to please themselves, satisfy themselves. For the present time, we are the people running for heaven, running to heaven, ambitious for heaven, desirous of heaven. They don't think about heaven. They don't have anything to lose. A man that is on the ground cannot get lower. Is the one on the mountain top, on the tree top. That's the one that needs to take care. You are the one on the top. You are the one saying, "I want heaven. I want heaven. I want heaven." And therefore, you are the one that has something to lose. If the man he doesn't want you to pull him up. He wants to stay on the ground where he is. A sinner, you talk about hell, he doesn't care, he doesn't even know whether there's hell or not. You are the one that knows about heaven. You are the one that has a conscience. You are the one that knows without holiness no man shall see the Lord. You are the one to follow peace with them. They will not try and follow peace with you. You that want to get to heaven, follow peace with all men. The landlord, we don't quarrel with landlords. The bus conductor, we don't quarrel with bus conductors. We don't quarrel on, I wanted to marry her, and he has snatched the lady away from me. We will fight it out. If you want to get to heaven, we don't fight. Follow peace with all men. And they should have chosen me to give that message, and they chose the other fellow. And then you are acting as if you are holding malice with the person who chose the other fellow. Follow peace with all men. I should have been an overseer by now. They chose the other fellow. You want to lose heaven because of that. Leave all that alone. I about Joseph. All that Joseph should have got, he missed. But then he just, he just lived his life. Even in the foreign land. Even in Egypt, just lived his life. And then the time came when the Lord promoted him. If the promotion comes, praise the Lord. If it doesn't come, heaven is more important. Follow peace with all men. Fighting about salary. In the place of work. And you will be one of the people now carrying placards with those unbelievers. You are not in the same camp. That's the only thing those people know how to do. You are for heaven. Follow peace with all men. And then it says, and uh, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Whatever else we do. Whatever else we have, if we don't have the holiness, if we don't hold that holiness with both hands and then say, Lord, whatever will happen, and you pray with all your heart, all your soul, until that holiness is restored again. What else are we living for? Follow peace with all men and holiness without which, tell me the rest. Now you are going to say, without which I shall not see the Lord. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which you will not see the Lord if you are not holy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let's rise up and pray. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Are you really, are you born again? Are you free from sin? Are you a true child of God? Do you have the witness, the testimony 
of the Spirit of God within you that your sins are forgiven. Then the Lord said, Go a step further. Go a step further. Purity of heart. A pure heart. Is your heart pure? Or is your heart defiled? Or is your heart impure? Is your heart unclean? If your actions are unclean, your heart is unclean. If your language is unclean to those ladies, your heart is unclean. If your heart is polluted with those relationships between men and women in your place of work, Although we are not there to see you, but you know what you do. If your relationship is unclean, polluted, your heart is unclean, your heart is polluted. But you can come to the stream, to the fountain of the blood of the Lamb, and say, Lord, I come for cleansing in the fountain of the blood of the Lamb today. And the Lord will wash you, and the Lord will cleanse you, and pour you, and purify you. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Is your heart circumcised? Or the old carnal nature is in you? Is your heart circumcised? And the Lord thy God shall well circumcise your heart. And the heart of your seed. That you will love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, that thou mayest live. A new heart. A new heart. A new heart will I give unto you. Is the old heart still your problem? Stubborn will your problem? Stony heart, your problem? Unbroken will, your problem? Self will, your problem? The heart of Pharaoh, your problem? Why don't you come to God and say, God, enough, enough, enough. When are you going to prepare for heaven? That the Lord says, a new heart will I give you. A heart of flesh will I give you. I will take the stony heart, the stubborn will, out of your heart. And I will give you the heart of flesh. A perfect heart. Walking in the truth of the word of God. Walking in sincerity. Walking in the footsteps of Christ. A perfect heart. A perfect heart. You remember, Amaziah, he did that which was superficially right, externally right, but his heart was not perfect with his God. Is your heart or the Lord? Perfect heart. Perfect heart. Perfect heart. To walk in the ways of the Lord with a perfect heart. That the Lord will see that those actions are coming out of a perfect heart, a yielded heart, a submissive heart, a heart that is seeking to please the Lord and the Lord alone, not pleasing self, but a heart that is committed to pleasing the Lord and pleasing the Lord alone. A true heart, singleness of heart that is focused and fixed on wanting to please the Lord alone, an honest heart. It's possible. God did it for Enoch and do it for you and for me. God did it for Daniel, can do it for you and for me. God did it for Joseph, can do it for you and for me. God did it for Isaiah. Woe is me. I am undone. A man of unclean lips. 
and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the Lord and the glory of the Lord. Then flew one of the seraphims unto him and took the life coal from the altar of the Lord and touched his lips and said, Lo, this has touched your lips. Your sin is purged. Your iniquity is taken away. Then I heard a voice. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. Until the purity of heart, you are not ready for higher service before the Lord. He did it for Isaiah. He can do it for you. He did it for the disciples. Sanctify them. Sanctify them. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He can do it for you. He did it for David. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Purge me. Wash me whiter than snow. He can do it for you. But it takes prayer, takes consecration, takes yieldedness, takes laying everything on the altar of sacrifice. Lord, do it for me. The Lord Jesus Christ gave himself that he might sanctify you with his own blood. That she might be pure, holy, not having any blemish and wrinkle. Not having the signs of the old man in your heart, in your life anymore. Let the Lord do it. Sanctify them, Father. That they all may be one. I in them. They in me. As thou art in me and I in you. That they may be made perfect in one. That the world may know that you have sent me. That they may believe. That Jesus is Savior. Let him do it. Let him purge. Let him purify. Let him sanctify. Let him cleanse you. The blood of Jesus washes whiter than snow. The blood of Jesus washes whiter than snow. He can do it. If you will permit him, allow him to do it. When you lay it on the altar, say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. Maybe you had it before, but you have lost it. The means of multiplied activities, you have lost it. Stubbornness are setting. Malice are setting. Anger are setting. Love for conflict. Love for fighting. Asserting, strive, asserting. Why don't you tell the Lord? Men pleasing, asserting, rather than pleasing God and pleasing Him alone. All those things, pride, asserting. Being incorrigible, asserting. Why don't you tell the Lord, Lord, here I am. Do it for me again. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Purge me. Wash me whiter than snow. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Those who shake their hands from holding bribe, those who refuse to see those crimes on DVD, on video, on television. Your life is too precious that to be wasting your life looking at all those things. Ah, they are Christian DVDs. Christian DVD that pollutes the mind. That corrupts the mind. That teaches you the ways of the world. You've read, you've read all your Bible. You've listened to all the cassettes. All those faith messages. You've listened to all of them. You've developed yourself. Christian entertainment is what remains. 
Get rid of them. Prepare for heaven. Don't waste precious time looking at something that doesn't develop your faith, that pollutes your mind, corrupts your mind, that reveals the crimes of the world to you more and more. We shall see him when he shall come. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself. As he is pure. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Follow peace with all men. Follow peace with all men. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Follow peace with all men. And holiness without which you cannot see the Lord.